our first um, mini lecture is on convolution systems. And so what are convolution systems? They're a sort of special class of input-output systems. And um, yeah, so we're, today we're talking about input-output systems. And what is an input-output system? Well, it's an abstract mathematical object uh, that sort of encompasses the dynamical models of things that we would like to understand. So uh, control is all about understanding dynamical systems and designing control systems to make dynamical uh, systems behave in um, more beneficial ways. And input-output systems are sort of the core building block for such systems. So um, say we have a car and we want to understand how applying a force to um, the pedal affects the speed of the car. So this would be the system that we want to understand and the input would be the force we apply to the pedal, the output would be the speed of the car and the control, the control engineer would then want to sort of understand that model and then understand how they should control the force they, or what force they should pick to apply to the pedal in order to get the uh, velocity to be, be what they want to be. So input-output systems are sort of like the core objects um, for modeling dynamical systems. You can build complicated dynamical models out of simple models for lots of individual components where you then feed the outputs of subcomponents into the inputs of others and understanding these is really what all of control theory is about and today we want to talk about a very very important class of input output system and that's the uh, convolution systems and these are really going to correspond to the systems that have transfer functions or linear systems. Um, and this is where a lot of uh, control analysis tools are strongest. And it's also a very good fit for typical control theoretic objectives. And we'll sort of get back into that a bit uh, later in the course. But today's really just about understanding this special class of convolution system. What does it mean? Why, why on earth uh, convolution system? Um, so let's just start off by saying what it is. So. It's an input-output system, so it's a system that takes an input u of t, and this is some function of time, and it's typically some signal that's uh, defined for positive time only. So a typical input might be a step. If we think back to our car example, we apply a, we have a car, and we want we just apply a constant force to the pedal, and we want to see what happens. Um, so we have some input, the convention to have things defined for positive time is just a convention. We could have, rather than starting things at t is equal to zero, it could be minus 100, but we've got to pick something, so let's just pick zero. Um, um, so we take an input and it will produce an output. So in the case of our car, we apply this step um, to the pedal and maybe the velocity starts to increase and then it gets to a certain point and maybe it settles down, something like that. So we, ha we have this sort of picture of an input-output system in which we put in input signals and we get output signals. And in convolution systems, the input and output are related in a very special way through the convolution integral. And um, what that says is that the output, so the value of the output signal y at time t is given by this integral here. We have g of t minus tau u of tau d tau. So this is our convolution integral. What on earth is this thing g? This is the impulse response of the system. And any particular system, so a car or I don't know, a hydroelectric power station or anything will will have an impulse response. So this is, if you like, it's like the fingerprint or the the representation of the dynamics of the particular system that we're interested in. Uh, impulse response, what on earth does that mean? Well, an impulse is a very special, well, I think I'm not allowed to call it a function, but let's say, let's not worry about that. So impulse is a, 
special function uh, that has the, the following key property. Um, and that is, it takes, we can apply our, so delta t, this is how we're going to represent the impulse. And then we put any um, function f of t and we integrate it like this and this will return the value of f at t is equal to zero. So the impulse is a special function that like sifts out a specific value of another function. And if you want to sort of imagine what that would mean in the input-output framework, well, you could imagine putting in input signals that look like very sort of sharp spikes. And um, the sort of the characteristic is that this is supposed to be a function of infinite height and infinitely narrow width, but with unit area. But uh, so you just imagine that you've got the system and you're giving it a short, sharp shock and you see what happens. So this is our impulse, delta t. We have our system in question and this will produce maybe some output. And this specific output, this is the special output called our impulse response. Um, so the impulse response is the response of our system to an impulsive input. And sort of the claim of a convolution system is that this impulse response is enough to characterize the behavior or the response of a system, not just to impulses, but in fact to any input we like. So based just on knowledge of what that input is and this impulse response, we're able to work out the behavior um, or, the, or the output of the system in the general case, not just in the impulsive input case. So this is uh, what a convolution system is. But what I really want to talk about today is like why? Why are we modeling things as convolution systems? It all seems a bit weird and a bit mysterious. Why is this impulse response so central to understanding the behavior of systems? Or maybe put another way, what do we have to assume about our system in order for it to have its input-output behavior described by a convolution system? And that's the question that we're really going to try and focus on now. So why? Why? Why convolution systems? And what we're now going to see is that um, for a system to be described by a convolution, it really has to satisfy kind of three basic assumptions. And understanding those assumptions sort of tells you more about when is it valid to model a system with a convolution system. Um, we're going to do a lot of analysis of convolution systems, and the theory is very nice. Um, Transfer functions have got all sorts of nice properties, and we can say all sorts of nice things about their behavior. But understanding these core assumptions will sort of tell you under what conditions we can get away with using all of this nice analysis so that we're, just, we're not just doing nice analysis for the sake of it. Um, so what are the key properties that we need? Um, I guess we could start with the most controversial or the most unlikely to be satisfied in reality. So this is the one that you have to keep track of the most. This is sort of the assumption that's most likely to be invalid um, when using this kind of framework. So this one requires uh, the most care from the engineer uh, to, to make sure that any predictions are, are sensible. And that is of linearity. So let's just remind ourselves. Um, so our first, the first thing we need um, in order to describe things with a convolution system is linearity. Um, so how are we going to frame this? So I'm just going to write things as follows. So I'm going to say we don't know that we have a convolution system. We just have some general description. So we have an input-output system. So we know y of t is given by 
the action of some, so this is like describing a system, and it takes as it takes the input u of t and it produces the output y of t. We don't know what this thing is, but this is just the thing that describes what our system does. Um, and the first thing we're going to assume about this more abstract object, uh, funny s here, is that it's linear. So what does that mean? It means that uh, it means two things. It means that if we apply the sum of two different inputs. So if we get our funky system and we apply the sum of two signals, u1 of t plus u2 of t, then this is equal to the sum of the responses to the individual systems. So this is the first defining property of linearity. And the second one is this homogeneity um, assumption. And so if we scale the inputs, we end up scaling the outputs, is what it means. Um, so if we apply a times u1 of t, where this is just some constant, then the output is given by a times s u1 of t. So this is what it means for a system to be linear. And under what conditions is linearity a valid assumption? Well, in for small signal behaviors, you can well approximate almost any system by a linear system. So th this is sort of the key thing to have in the back of your mind. Um, everything that we're talking about in the course is for linear systems. Linearity is a valid assumption for small signals, but if in your analysis or simulations you do of sort of more complicated models, you see that some signals are getting large, then you maybe need to look a bit more closely at your analysis and question, was I right to use this linear systems theory if we got large deviations? Um, we saw large deviations in our response. Do we need to do something more sophisticated? Do we need to take the nonlinear control course? Um, yeah, that kind of thing. So this is our first and most controversial assumption that is required um, to give us a convolution system. So linearity, this is the first one. Um, where am I going to put the next one? The next ones are less controversial and will take up less space. So uh, let's try and sneak it in here. And the second thing we need is time invariance. And what does this mean? Well, it means if we apply one input today and we apply the same input tomorrow, then the response today would be the same as the response tomorrow. Um, and how can we sort of write this in our abstract notation? Well, this is saying that if y of t is equal to the what our system does to some input u of t, then this is the same as saying that y of t minus capital T, which is, so this is our the, uh, our sh shift in time is equal to the action of our system on the shifted input. So this is also um, not guaranteed to be true. Um, maybe the pr the system that you're interested in is like slowly degrading over time. You're you're modeling an aircraft, and as you use the aircraft, it sort of takes on damage and bits wear out, so maybe the, the dynamics is changing over time. And so if you have a process like that, you won't be time invariant. I guess another classic example might be a, you could stick with aircraft. Um, during a flight, it uses fuel, and that will change the mass of the aircraft. So the dynamical, sort of the, the dynamical model of the aircraft will be changing over time, so it won't be time invariant. Um, and so, again, I guess probably most systems are not time invariant, but maybe they are time invariant on the order of, on a 10 second horizon, maybe they are well approximated by something that's time invariant. Um, so in terms of like fast dynamics of systems, time invariance is a reasonable assumption, but long uh, time horizons of the order of hours or days or years, um, it's not so valid, but this is something that we also need. 
Um, so we've got time invariance, and the final one is uh, causality. And this is probably the least controversial. Um, it just means that whatever input you apply now won't affect what happened in the past. So any input you apply can only have an effect on the output in the future. And for our purposes, and there's lots of ways to uh, define this. Uh, so our final one is causality. And the, the key thing we need here is we're just going to say that if y of t is the response to an impulse, then this implies that y of t is 0 for t less than 0. So we apply our impulse at time t is equal to 0, and the output of our system is 0 in the past. So this is sort of our abstract description of what it means for a system to be causal. And now what we're going to do, and we're going to show over here, is that if we have these three properties of a system, so if our abstract description S satisfies linearity, time invariance, and causality, then in fact we get a convolution system. So the fact that we were describing things through this convolution is not arbitrary at all. It's a natural consequence of these three assumptions. And so by understanding this, we know under what conditions this modeling class is valid. And we also know that we couldn't have picked something bigger than convol There's not like some super convolution systems that also satisfy these more abstract properties and could we could build an equally powerful theory for. This is like the convolution systems are a natural consequence of these assumptions. So going the other way is much easier. Convolution system satisfies these three properties. More abstractly here, these three properties give a convolution system. Um, and so how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply our input u of t. So we're, just, we're now going to focus in on this. And we're going to also now define the impulse response. So according to this, our impulse response is given by the action of our system when we apply an impulse. We're not saying anything more about this. This is just what g of t is defined to equal. Um, it's the response of our system to an impulse. So what can we do with this? Well, now let's focus in on this equation here. So we know any input y of t is equal to the action of our system on u of t but now let's rewrite that input. What's another way of rewriting u of t? Well, we can also write this in terms of um, impulses. So we're just rewriting u of t. Uh, um, yes, delta t minus tau u of tau. Detail. Um, so this thing here, this is just another way of writing u of t. And this follows directly from this sifting uh, property here. So any input can be rewritten as an integral involving this impulse. And now uh, let's apply some linearity here. So, so what is this integral? It's just uh, like a, a sum of lots and lots of little slices. So we can apply our linearity property here to say that this must be equal to the integral of the action of our system on delta t minus tau u of tau. Detail. 
So by linearity, we've just got the sum of lots of inputs. So in equivalently, we can just sum all the outputs. So that's just the, the integral version of this uh, relationship here. So this is linearity. And also, from the homogeneity property of linearity, this thing is equal to u of tau s of delta t minus tau d tau. So this is just a constant. Assuming things are scalar here, we can do vector case in a similar way if we wanted. This is just a scalar, so we can pull the scalar out. That's what this, uh, where is it? This is just a constant. Um, so we've got this homogeneity property. And now we're almost there, because we see ah, this is connected to our g of t. So this is our impulse response. We've got this time shift here, but this is where we use our time invariance property. So if we shift the output in time, we just uh, shift the input in Sorry, shift the input in time, we just shift the output in time. So we know g of t, this is the response to an impulse at time t is equal to zero. If we just shift the time of the, Im the impulse, we just shift the time of the, out uh, uh, the output. So this is now we've got our u of tau still. And this is g of t minus tau d tau. So we're almost there. We've got something that matches almost exactly. Um, and uh, the only problem is the limits of this integral. And this is where our final piece uh, comes together. Um, so we now just need causality. So what did we say? We said that, um, yeah, for causality, the response to the impulse was um, 0 for negative time. So that just means that our impulse response function looks something like this. It's equal to 0 for negative arguments. And so that means that for values of tau greater than t, the input here is negative. But when this is negative, g is just equal to 0. So for values of tau larger than t, g of t minus tau is 0. And so because the system is causal, this is now the integral t0, u of tau, g of t minus tau, d tau. And there you have it. By assuming nothing about our system, except that it was linear, time invariant, and causal, we found that the output must be given by a convolution of the input with the impulse response of our system. And this is what a convolution system is. And so this is sort of what the whole input-output uh, transfer function framework is all for. And what you sort of have is a very principled uh, basis on which um, all of these linear, all this linear system theory is built. Um, so. You, this was just for interest and sort of get things going, but um, yeah, convolution systems. <laughs>